Hello, I'm James Holland and the good people of the Tank Museum here at Bobbington have asked me to choose my top five tanks. Now, since I'm a historian of the Second World War, it's World War II that dominates my selection. Now, if you've enjoyed this, please do subscribe to the Tank Museum's YouTube channel and do come and visit this absolutely amazing museum. It really is an incredible place. But first of all, let's go to my number five on the list. Well, of course, you can't have top five tanks of the Second World War and not include the German Tiger. The problem with this is it's just so complicated. It's got, I mean, just take the transmission, for example. It's got a six-speed semi-hydraulic pre-selector gearbox designed by Ferdinand Porsche. It sounds complicated. It is complicated. You put it in the stress and strains of battle, it's going to break down, and so it did. You know, it, it's enormous. It can't fit on the continental loading gauge of the railway, which is the kind of lifeblood of the Germans in the Second World War, without changing the tracks. They're just too wide. So to get it from A to B, you've got to put it on a train, with, on a wagon with different tracks, take the tracks off, get it off again, put the combat tracks on, then move it forward. I mean, it's just an absolute nightmare. You know, it's so complicated, it's so big. Um, it uses so much fuel, and of course the one thing the Germans don't have is lots of fuel. So in one way they're shooting themselves in the foot, but where this really scores points is in its fear factor. And the fear factor of the Tiger tank is absolutely enormous. I mean, just look at it. It's a beast. It's got enormous armor. It's got a massive 80 millimeter gun. If you come across this, you're going to be scared. You're going to be terrified. You're going to want to run away. And that's the effect it has. And so that fear factor really, really cannot be stressed enough. But it is an overly complicated, over-engineered piece of kit that doesn't really do what the Germans want for it. But it is still a pretty amazing tank. Now, number four on my list is the Panzer Mark IV. Now, actually, from a distance, it doesn't look too dissimilar from the Tiger tank. It's obviously a lot smaller. But this is the only German tank to have been in service in 1939 when the war began and still in service in 1945 when the war ended. What's really interesting about it is it changed quite a lot over the course of the war, but its basic design remained the same. So you can see it's quite wide. And what that enabled it to do was, as the war progressed and things changed, so they could upgun it, increase the size of the turret, add extra armor, do all sorts of extra things. So to start off with, it had a very small, low velocity gun. Later on, it got this much bigger 75 millimeter gun, a high velocity gun on it. And you know, it's a real workhorse, eight and a half thousand of them built, which is by far and away the most numerous of German tanks. And it just sees action everywhere. For a German tank, it's comparatively uncomplicated. And as we know, the Germans love to over-engineer absolutely everything. So what's good about this is actually it's comparatively straightforward, comparatively reliable, much more reliable than the Panther or the Tiger or anything like that, and the real workhorse of the German Panzer arm. Well, number three on my list is the Cromwell tank. And in many ways, it's a kind of sort of rather forgotten, unsung hero of the British Army and the Allied forces in the sort of last part of the Second World War. But I think this is a really, really good tank. Mechanically, it was pretty reliable. It's pretty simple and straightforward. I mean, all tanks are complicated, don't get me wrong, but it's basically pretty good. It's got two machine guns. It's got a 75 millimeter um, uh, main gun three inches of armor, it's got lovely low profile, that's pretty useful, but what it's really got is speed. And it's often forgotten that immediately following the end of the Normandy campaign in the third week of August 1944, the Allies then stormed ahead to this incredible lightning strike of sort of over 200 miles up to sweeping up towards Belgium. And they actually went further in that period, in a shorter period of time, than the Germans did in their incredible blitzkrieg in France and the Low Countries back in May 1940. And large part of that was down to the Cromwell tank, which could hurtle along at well over 35 miles an hour, which, trust me, in a tank of this size, is going some. So for me, this is, this is underrated, undervalued, but I value it, and that's why I've got it as my number three. 
Well, my number two on my list is the Churchill Crocodile. I love the Churchill anyway, but the Crocodile is a completely fearsome tank. It's not really a tank, it is a tank, but it's also a flamethrower. I mean, this is the trailer here, which contains the liquid rubber, oil and petrol. It's effectively napalm. And it can, you can work up the, the pressure and then it can fire a spouted flame of napalm 120 yards long. The, cro uh, the Churchill tank itself has got the thickest armour of any tank um, in 1944. So it is a pretty big beast. It can go up pretty much anything. There is no tank that can go up a steeper slope in World War II than the Churchill. Combine this together, that has a massive fear factor. Now the problem with the Churchill is it's incredibly slow. But who cares about that when you've got this incredible flame throwing capability. And what is really interesting is when you are looking at German testimonies and German records and oral histories about their experiences of fighting the war, it is absolutely abundantly clear that German soldiers fear the crocodile more than Allied soldiers fear the dreaded tiger tank. Well, my number one tank was actually not a difficult choice at all. It is the fabulous, wonderful Sherman Firefly. Now, I love Sherman tanks, but I particularly love the Firefly with its extra 17-pounder anti-tank gun thrust into the turret. But the Sherman is just, you know, what's so brilliant about this is it's reliable, it's, it's easy to maintain, and these are all factors which are not very sexy, but actually incredibly important when you're in a long, drawn-out, attritional war. And there's so many features about the Sherman which just really work. It's a 30-ton tank, so it's not a 56-ton beast like the Tiger. It's a 30-ton tank, and that's important because when it's introduced, um, at the Battle of Alamein in, in October 1942. It marks a sort of point where suddenly the Allies are going forward all the time. Now, if you're going forward all the time, that means your enemy is retreating. Now, what happens when the enemy retreats, whenever it meets a river or a, or a, or a dike or, or whatever, it blows up the bridges uh, and makes it as difficult for the, for the, for the um, Allies to advance as they possibly can. So you then have to, as the Allies moving forward, what they've got to do is they've got to bridge those rivers, those creeks, those dikes and all the rest of it. How do they do that? Well, they use a Class 40 Bailey Bridge. That is the easiest, quickest, most reliable way to bridge something quickly. A Class 40 Bailey Bridge is called a Class 40 Bailey Bridge because it can take 40 tonnes. So there is absolutely no point in having a heavy 50 tonne tank because it ain't going to get across the river that you've just bridged with your Class 40 Bailey Bridge. But a Sherman tank, 40 tonnes, even with five guys in it, with ammunition, with extra logs put on the side for extra protection, a couple of chickens on the back for food, it's still going to be under 40 tonnes. So it can always go forward. The other thing is everything about it is done with pragmatism in mind. The whole point of it is that it can be repaired very, very easily in the field. And there's lots of design features which really, really work for the Sherman. Now look at the tracking system. You know, to the uneducated, this is just some tracks and some wheels. But actually, it's really simple. They haven't got interleaved wheels. They've got thick boys here with rubber on. And you've got the suspension bogies on the outside, which means if one of them gets damaged, all you've got to do is undo a few bolts here and put another one on. Whereas on the Panther, for example, it's got so many wheels that to get to the suspension, you've got to go, you've got to take the whole tracks off, all the wheels off, get inside it. You know, it's really difficult to repair. Ease of maintenance in the field is absolutely crucial. The other thing is that you can, you can change an engine in about two hours if you really have to. It's just you open up the hatch at the back here, you get a crane in, you pull it out, put another one in. It's really very, very straightforward. All these things really, really matter. And mechanically, it's very simple. Four gears forward, one back, easy to, easy to drive, easy to learn on. Um, and easy again to maintain. Even the gearbox, the transmission, you see these bolts at the front? You can unbolt this, take this section out, pull out the gearbox, put another one in, repair it, whatever. All these things are really, really important. 
as I say, they're not sexy. They're not the kind of things that, that people really care about. Uh, and certainly, if you're a soldier in the Second World War, all you worry about is the fact you've got a big tank coming towards you with a big gun. You don't care about all these things. But it is really, really important that you understand in a long, drawn-out war that you can maintain these things in the field very, very easily. But the piece de resistance is unquestionably the 17-pounder gun. Now, normally, a Sherman just has a 75mm gun which is a sort of medium velocity. Velocity is what really counts, and that is the speed with which the shell is passing through the air. A 17-pounder is, for my money, the best anti-tank gun of the war. And it's originally designed as just a basic anti-tank gun, you know, with a, with a sort of armor out the front, the two, two forks, you hitch it up onto a truck or whatever. But they put it, they adapt it to put it in a Sherman tank. And this thing can fire a shell at around 3,000 feet per second, which is fractionally greater than the dreaded German 88mm. And later on, in August 1944, they introduced the armour-piercing discarding sabot. And this can hurtle a shell at around 4,000 feet per second. There is nothing else in the war that can fire something as fast as that. I mean, it's just absolutely phenomenal. And at distance, it's not massively accurate, but up to a thousand meters or something, a thousand yards. It's an absolute tank killer. It really is. Put this together, 17 pounder anti-tank gun, best anti-tank gun of the war, with the most reliable, easy to maintain tank of the war, practical, sensible tank. You've got an absolute winner. Final point, numbers. There's 1,347 Tigers built, there's 49,000 Shermans and 74,000 Sherman hulls which are, be, uh, are built. That is mass production. Numbers really count in the Second World War. So for me, this is a winner. Isn't it a thing of wonder? Well, that's my top five tanks. I hope you found them interesting. I hope you've enjoyed what I've had to say. Uh, please do support the Tank Museum and subscribe to their YouTube channel and also support them on Patreon. It's an amazing place and it needs your support.